We are continuing our series in First and Second Samuel that we have called uh, Looking for a King that Pastor Josh is so wonderfully leading us through. And so I want to invite you to take your copy of God's Word, whether you have it in hardback form, on your phone, tablet, however, however you have it, and turn with me or click with me to 1 Samuel 11 and 12. Put something there, and then if you want to turn as well to 1 Samuel chapter 3, we're going to make reference to 1 Samuel 3 as well. We're going to go back in time just a little bit during part of this message. And as you're turning there, I want to ask you a personal question. It is a personal question which means please don't answer it out loud. I mean, unless you want to, you can just blurt it out there if you want to, but here's the question. This past week, as we're starting a new week, this past week, did you lie to anyone this past week? Some of those questions where you need to be honest. Did you lie to anyone this past week? Did you shade the truth? Did you stretch the truth? Did you deceive Did you tell, you know, one of those little white lies? Did you lie to anyone this past week? Now, if you said no, you probably just lied. (laughs) In fact, you really double lied because you lied about lying. There was a guy who was standing on a street corner and holding up a sign that said, talking dog for sale, ten dollars. As he was standing there with his dog and this sign, another guy walked by and said, are you serious about that? That dog can't talk. To which then immediately the dog said, please, sir, please buy me. This guy is mean to me. He never takes me for walks. He hardly ever feeds me. He keeps me cooped up all day and I just can't stand it anymore. Well, the man looked at the dog's owner, the guy who was holding the sign, and said, that dog really can talk. Why are you selling him for only $10? To which the owner said, because all he does is lie. (laughs) Now that'll have to sink in at lunch when you guys are, are out eating and talking this afternoon. Did you know that the average person tells 13 lies a week? I'm not very good at math, but that's nearly two lies a day. A study revealed that 60% of adults can't have a 10-minute conversation without lying at least once. And we don't play favorites when it comes to lying either. The study revealed, that same study revealed, that we lie most to our parents, 86%. Our friends, 75%. Our siblings, 73%, and our spouses, 69%. Sadly, we are living in a world where lying is common. I mean, it's practically expected where we just lie. You might think honesty is an easy word to define. But honesty really encompasses more than what most people think. Children are prone to think, and you might even think, that honesty is simply not lying. Now that is true. But in addition to telling the truth, honesty requires doing the truth, and honesty requires living the truth. Someone who's honest tells the truth, which means they do not lie. Someone who is honest does the truth, which means they do not cheat. And someone who is honest lives the truth, which means they do not steal. This morning we're going to talk about honesty and integrity. Now most of you, I'm sure, this morning when you got ready, looked in a mirror. A mirror becomes increasingly important in your life, whether you're about to go to school, whether you're about to go to work, whether you're about to come to church, or whether you're about to go out on a date. The one thing that you make sure that you do before you leave the house, probably even multiple times, is you look in the mirror. And the reason why we look in the mirror is because that mirror never lies. 
That mirror is going to show you what you look like when you have makeup on and when you don't. That mirror is going to show you when you're clean shaven and when you're not. That mirror is going to show you when your hair is in place or when your hair is all over the place or even when you don't have any hair to put in place. (laughs) That mirror is going to show you. There's nothing fake. There's nothing hidden in your mirror image. But this morning, we're not going to talk about what you see physically when you look in a mirror. We're going to talk about what you see spiritually, morally, and ethically when you look in a mirror. This morning, I think we're going to talk about the most important thing about all of us. And that is our character. So what do you see when you look in the mirror? I don't mean what do you see on the outside when you look in the mirror. But if that mirror were to reflect what you are on the inside, what would you see? Or more importantly, what should you see? Now, I may be old-fashioned, but I still believe that character is still important. And I still believe that character still matters. We're living in a day, church, and you know this to be true, when people are more concerned about their reputation than they are about their character. And the latter isn't always a true reflection of the former. Your reputation is who others think you are. But your integrity or your character is who you really are. It's been said, and I don't know who originally said it, but it's been said that people are like trees. The shadow of the tree is reputation. The fruit of the tree is personality. But the root of the tree is character. And so here's a great question for you to ask yourself sometime. If your reputation met your character on the street, would they recognize each other? And so what makes up good character? What would be good character traits that would be true of you if your character wasn't just good but godly or your character wasn't just what you would like it to be but what God would want it to be? I would say that the first trait that would be real in your life, the first thing that people would know about you if you truly have right character is integrity. If character were a deck of cards, integrity would be the trump card. If you were building a house of character, integrity would be the foundation. Integrity is to personal character what health is to the body or what 2020 vision is to the eyes. All other virtues flow from this one character trait called integrity. You've heard it said before that everything rises and falls on leadership. And that's absolutely true. But I would add something to that. Not only does everything rise and fall on leadership, but leadership rises and falls on integrity. In fact, none of the other character traits will matter in your life if you don't have integrity. Even more to the point, You won't have hardly any of the other character traits if you don't have integrity. Integrity is more important than fame. Integrity is more important than fortune. It's more important than position. It's more important than possessions. It's more important than popularity. What you accomplish will make your name known. But your integrity will determine if your name is worth knowing. Warren Buffett realized the importance of integrity when he said these words. We look for three things when we hire people. We look for intelligence, we look for initiative, and we look for integrity. And if they don't have the latter, the first two will kill you. Now you don't have to look very far, church, to see that we're living in a world that is in an integrity crisis 
today. The propensity to lie, to cheat, to deceive, to shade the truth has affected how we see ourselves and it has affected how we see each other. But even though the practice of integrity may be declining, the importance of integrity is greater than ever. So what is integrity? The English word integrity comes from the Latin word integer, which we use in reference to numbers. An integer is a whole number. Likewise, a person of integrity is a whole person. They are complete. In other words, just like a whole number, integrity cannot be divided. You can't have partial integrity. You can't have integrity only in certain areas. If you possess integrity, it covers your whole life, not just certain parts of your life. As Warren Wearsby said in one of his commentaries, a person with integrity is not divided. That's duplicity. Or merely pretending. That's hypocrisy. Integrity is a word that has such a deep and broad meaning that capturing the word integrity in a single sentence is very, very difficult. Someone said integrity is doing what you say you will do unless it is wrong. C.S. Lewis said integrity is doing what is right when no one is looking. And there's truth to that. When it comes to integrity, it's rooted in your private life. That part of your life where nobody goes but you and God. Simply put, you are what you are in private. Nothing more, nothing less. Integrity is when your private life is consistent with your public life. It's when your behavior matches your belief. It's when what you show on the outside is a true reflection of what you believe on the inside and vice versa. It's when your words match your ways. It's when your attitudes match your actions. It's what you are, matter of fact, who you are, when no one else sees what you're doing. You know, it's easy for us to come in here on Sunday and be religious and say and do religious things. It's easy to say amen. It's easy to say brother. But where the real challenge comes is in living out our faith is when we're alone those other six days of the week. It's easy to look like a person of integrity when people are watching. But the question is, do I live my private life with the same level of consistency as I live my public life? Some of you I've given my definition of faith to. And if you want to hear it sometime, come up to me and I'll give you my simple definition of what faith is. And the reason I say that is because when I've thought about it, I've kind of got my own definition of integrity, which sounds very similar to my definition of faith. And here it is. Integrity is always doing the right thing at the right time in the right place, regardless of the costs or the consequences. In other words, integrity is simply doing the right thing no matter what. It's doing what is right, not what is easy. So I believe the foundation of character is integrity. And I believe the fruit of integrity is honesty. Honesty is saying what you mean and meaning what you say. Integrity is saying what you will do and then doing what you will say. But integrity is more than just honesty, but there can be no integrity without honesty. You may say, Derek, where are you going with all this? Hang on, we're getting there. Stephen Covey said this, integrity includes but goes beyond honesty. Honesty is telling the truth. In other words, conforming our words to reality. Integrity is conforming reality to our words. In other words, keeping promises and fulfilling expectations. This requires an integrated character, a oneness, primarily with self, but also with life. Many people equate integrity with honesty, but as I said, integrity is more than honesty. Because in a sense, you can be honest without having integrity. If you're caught stealing... 
and you honestly confess that crime, you may be honest, but you still lack integrity. So living a life of integrity requires more than just making sure we say the right things. It also requires that we also do the right things. Our actions must match our words. After surveying thousands of people around the world and after conducting over 400 case studies, two psychologists identified traits that are most desired in a leader. In virtually every study, do you want to guess what two traits were mentioned more than every other trait? Honesty and integrity. To me, that just makes sense. I mean, if you're going to follow someone, whether it's into battle, whether it's in business, whether it's in ministry, you want someone you can trust, someone who is honest, someone who keeps their promises, and someone who follows through with their commitments. This morning, we're going to look at someone who was without question one of the greatest people in the Bible, and it was primarily because of his honesty and his integrity. His name? Samuel. Samuel to me is one of those unsung heroes of the Bible. He's one of those people of the Bible that I would call a spiritual superstar. And here's why. I'm a sports fanatic and I love baseball. And in baseball, scouts look for players that can do five things excellently. They're what's called five tool players. They will look for players who can run, who can throw, who can catch, who can hit for average, and who can hit for power. And I want to be fair to all generations, so I'm going to name three five-tool players, two from yesteryear and one from current day, because very few players in Major League Baseball history have been five-tool players. One of them, Willie Mays. Another one, Ken Griffey Jr. And today, who plays for the Los Angeles Angels, Mike Trout. Well, just as there were five tool baseball players that scouts looked for, in the Old Testament, there were five key positions that you could hold. One was a seer. Two was a priest. Three was a judge, four was a prophet, and five was a military leader. And there's only one man in the entire Old Testament who fulfilled all five of those roles, and his name was Samuel. But that's not what set Samuel apart. What elevated Samuel, both in the eyes of God and in the eyes of his people, was his unfailing uncompromising integrity. What distinguished Samuel was not the high positions that he held. What distinguished Samuel was the honest person that he was. Last week, Pastor Josh led us through 1 Samuel 9 and 10. And in 1 Samuel 10, we saw where Samuel was anointed as, as Samuel anointed Saul as king. In 1 Samuel chapter 11, Saul leads the people of Israel to fight their first battle against the Ammonites and to rescue their city of Jabesh Gilead. The people are elated and they affirm Saul as their king. So the people now recognize Saul as their leader and Samuel is going to now step back from taking the leadership role. And that's where chapter 12 comes in. Here in 1 Samuel 12, the nation of Israel again has already chosen a king for the first time in their history. And it's now time for Samuel to leave the scene. Not that he will cease to be a prophet, but as a leader. Israel will now look to Saul as their king to lead them. Keep in mind, Samuel's not stepping down. He's just stepping aside for Saul. And what we see here in 1 Samuel 12 is Samuel's giving his farewell address to the people. And he's going to set the record straight about who he was, about how he had lived, and about all that he had said. 
In Samuel's life, we learn what it means to be honest and live with integrity. There's really two main points, and we'll move through quickly on your message outline. The first one is this. Integrity means you speak truth with your lips. Now, before we get to Samuel's farewell address, we got to start when he was just a boy. You guys know when we first started this series and Pastor Josh was, was leading us back then through the series, Samuel's mother, Hannah, couldn't conceive. She prayed, God heard her prayer, and Samuel was born. She took Samuel to the temple to be dedicated, to have his entire life dedicated to the Lord, and she left him there with a high priest named Eli. So Eli kind of became his, his guardian and his mentor. And we're told in that day that there were very few visions from the Lord. But one night as Samuel was lying in his bed about to go to sleep, not once, not twice, but three times, a voice calls his name. All three times he gets up thinking it's Eli that, that's calling him. So he goes to Eli, but Eli denies that he's the one who's calling him and sends him back to bed. After the third time, Eli realizes it must be the Lord that's calling Samuel. So Eli says these words to Samuel. He says, the next time you hear his voice, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And again, the Lord calls, Samuel responds and then the Lord reveals to Samuel in a vision what's going to happen to Eli and his family because Eli had allowed his two sons to defile the altar, bully people into giving them offerings they didn't deserve, and sleeping with other women. And here's what the text says, starting in verse 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or by offering. Now I want you to put yourself in Samuel's shoes. No doubt he's stunned and shocked by what he just heard. Remember, Eli has shown him the ropes. Eli's taught him all of the tricks of the trade. Eli has poured his life into Samuel. And Samuel doesn't want to tell Eli what God just said. But inevitably this happens in verse 15. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide anything that he told you. Now, if you're Samuel, what would you do? I mean, you're not even old enough to drive a chariot yet. This guy, Eli, knows more about God's word in his little finger than you do in your entire body. What do you do? Do you tell a lie? Do you say something like, oh, I don't remember. I was half asleep whenever I heard it. I don't remember what he said. In situations like this, kids lie. Maybe Eli or maybe Samuel was even tempted to tell a fib of his own. We really don't know. But keep in mind, this is a test for Samuel. He listened to the truth. Now will he tell the truth? Even though it will be rough and difficult, will Samuel tell Eli what Eli wants to hear? Or will Samuel tell Eli what Eli needs to hear? The next verse tells us in verse 18. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Samuel learned at a very young age that honesty is the best policy. That you always tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Particularly since it's been given to you by God who is truth. That's why you read these next words beginning in verse 19. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. Samuel earned a reputation that he would always speak the truth no matter what the truth said. 
And that he would always say exactly whatever it was that God told him to say. And so Samuel is now officially recognized as a prophet by the nation. And he would be ever known, forever known as someone who would always speak the truth with his lips. Second, not only does integrity mean you speak truth with your lips, it also means you show truth through your life. Now let's fast forward some 40 years. Samuel's in his mid-50s. His ministry is coming to a close and Israel has decided that they want a king and he leads them to find a king. It's now time for Samuel to leave the stage and he's giving his final goodbye when we get to 1 Samuel 12 verse 1 which says this. Samuel said to all Israel, I have listened to everything you said to me and have set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I am old and gray, and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. So Samuel has a 40-year track record with these people. Many of these people have grown up with him. They've gone to school with him. They've worshiped with him. They've taken their problems to him, and they've gone to battle for him. But then he makes one of the boldest statements about personal character that you will find anywhere, I think, in history. Look what he says in verse 3. Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I taken a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these, I will make it right. Samuel says, in effect, open the books investigate, do an audit, see what you can find. He defies anybody to prove that he has deceived or defrauded anyone. Check his tax returns. Look at his expense reports and you'll find they will be accurate to the penny. Samuel had played no favorites. The last part there, he had taken no bribes. And he never wavered on telling the truth. Whenever you're a person of integrity, you never have to fear accusations or investigations. People can go through your closets because there are no skeletons in them. They can search your browser history because there's nothing bad in it. Your life can be an open book when you're a person of integrity because you have nothing to hide. There's no taking from the petty cash drawer. There's no abusing your lunch hour. There is no arriving late and leaving early. No hidden dirt whatsoever in your life. Zero. Zilch. Nothing. When you maintain your integrity, such as Samuel, you don't have to worry, spend your time worrying that someone's going to uncover a lie about you. You don't have to worry that you'll be caught doing something that you'll regret. You don't have to waste your time trying to make up excuses or rationalize for a moral failure or an ethical lapse. So Samuel makes a promise that he's going to repay anything that he's unjustly taken from anybody. Now that's an amazing promise, isn't it? But what's even more amazing was the response of the people. Look in verse 4. You have not cheated or oppressed us, they replied. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. And Samuel said to them, The Lord is witness against you and also His anointed, anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. He is witness, they said. Samuel's honesty and integrity permeated every area of his life. These two characteristics directed how he regarded his possessions, his business dealings, and his treatment of people who were even weaker than him. Samuel held himself accountable to the people that he led. He opened himself up to the scrutiny of everyone with whom that he had ever had any dealings whatsoever. So as we saw in chapter 3, Samuel began his life by being honest and telling the whole truth. And here in chapter 12, we see that Samuel ends his life by being honest and telling nothing but the truth. Now to live with integrity for a period of time, that's achievable. 
But Samuel lived that way all of his life. From childhood to what we read here in chapter 12 where he says he is old and gray. The people had nothing to accuse Samuel of. He's been honest with God and he's been honest with his people. He's been honest in life and he's been honest in ministry. People respected him. They held him in high regards because of the integrity of his heart. Church, this is the mark of a follower of Jesus. They live with integrity. Samuel did not take advantage of his position nor his people. And in the end, they testified to this. And as a result, Samuel's going to walk away with his honesty and his integrity intact. Look, I don't think there's anything better, greater, or higher in ending whatever career God has given you than to know that everyone else knows that you always speak the truth with your lips and you always show truth in your actions. So let's drive it home. Let's make it personal. Let's get honest about being honest. Can we do that? Let's be people of integrity. Let's determine to be people of integrity, regardless of the actions of others or the circumstances around us. Integrity never goes on vacation. Integrity never takes a break. Integrity never calls a time out. It never takes a pass. It doesn't go with the flow. It doesn't follow the crowd. It never veers off course. It never cuts corners. It never takes a shortcut. Integrity doesn't listen to the polls. Integrity lives for principles. Integrity stands its ground. Integrity never just talks the talk. It walks the walk. And here's the greatest reason and motivation to be a person of honesty and integrity. And that's because it pleases God. Yes, we should be people of honesty and integrity because of the social ramifications. But we should also, and more importantly, be people of honesty and integrity because it pleases God. Proverbs 12 says this, Lying lips are detestable to the Lord, but faithful people are His delight. So I want to challenge you to live an honest life that you will refuse to lie, deceive, or shade the truth. That you will be honest whether anyone's looking or not. That you will tell the truth when it's not popular. That you will keep your promises. That your word is your bond. And that your walk will match your talk. So beginning today, here's my challenge to you. Do yourself a favor and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Choose to live with integrity and you will never go wrong with that choice. Because when you have integrity, nothing else matters. And if you don't have integrity, then nothing else matters. Let me share an illustration as we close this morning. Some of you may have heard of this guy. A guy by the name of Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones is considered one of the best golfers in history. He has 13 majors before he retired at the age of 28. He was the first player to win four major tournaments in one year. His grandson, Bobby Jones IV, tells a story about his grandfather. It wasn't a tournament that he won with a great shot. It was a tournament about his integrity. Bobby Jones took a one-shot penalty at the 1925 U.S. Open. He inadvertently touched his golf ball and assessed himself a one-stroke penalty even though no one else saw him touch the ball. The tournament official said he didn't see it. His playing partner said he didn't see it. No one in the gallery said they saw it. They even tried to talk him out of assessing that penalty on himself and he would have been justified in not taking it. But Bobby Jones would not violate his conscience or compromise his integrity. He assessed himself the penalty and ultimately lost the U.S. Open 
by that one stroke. When tournament officials tried to compliment him for his integrity, Bobby Jones said, you might as well praise me for not breaking into banks. There's only one way to play this game. Bobby Jones could have won his 14th major, but he would have lost his integrity. To Bobby Jones, no win of any kind or size could ever compensate for the loss of one's integrity. God is looking for some people who will live with honesty and integrity. And as I look around this room here this morning, I ask you, will you be that person? Let's pray. Father, looking into your word, which is our mirror, we see ourselves as we really are. We first and foremost see you for who you are. And then we see us as we are. And sometimes we don't like what we see. Sometimes as we read your word, it, it cuts. Because we realize that we've been telling lies we realize that we've not been living as people of integrity, which is what you've called us to be. We are called to follow the example of Jesus, who was always truthful, who always did what he said he would do, kept his promises, kept his commitments. And as followers of Him, that's how you want us to live. And so, Father, I pray that we would live as such. And if we haven't been, I pray that today we will repent, get back on the right track living an honest life, no matter the cost, no matter the consequence. Holy Spirit, enable us to be able to do that. And God, I pray as we stand to sing this final song that we would just sing from our hearts to You, praising Your name, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.